Bonjour, dans Washington très grise. J'espère qu'il fait beau à Paris this morning. My name is Gordon Dugan. I'm the director of the Bureau uh, for European and Eurasian Affairs Office for Press and Public Diplomacy. I'm here to introduce today Professor Vangala Ram, who is one of our experts on disinformation. The United States continues to work with our allies around the world to strengthen our response to COVID-19, while at the same time, we have noticed uh, that so many people who are locked down, as, as we are uh, here, um, are still looking for uh, new information and good information about uh, what is happening today. So we decided that uh, we would organize a series of virtual American studies programs, as it were, in partnership with US embassies in Europe and the Meridian International Center. Uh, today, Dr. Ram is going to uh, talk to you about disinformation. He is a retired US diplomat who is now an adjunct professor at the National Intelligence University. His experiences in the diplomatic missions of the US in Africa, Europe, and the Middle East for over 27 years help inform his presentation today. We have seen during the current crisis how disinformation campaigns are used to try and drive wedges between friends and allies. Indeed, the definition of disinformation is that it is totally destructive as it is totally false. Dr. Ram's discussion today is a timely reminder that these tactics aren't new. Disinformation has always been used. And it's also a reminder of the importance of remaining responsible, critical, and vigilant consumers of media and of information. The U.S. Embassy in Paris is hosting today's discussion, and we thank them for that. We want to thank especially also the French universities who are following vir virtually. These include the management school at Gustave Eiffel uh, at University of Paris uh, Prete, via Zoom and um, HEC in Paris, as well as the saint germain en laye campus of Sciences Po via Facebook Live. We encourage you all to submit your questions via U.S. Embassy Paris's Facebook Live link. Thank you for joining us virtually today, and thank you for sharing your experience and expertise with our audience, Dr. Ram. I'll now hand it over to you to get started. Gordon, uh, many, many thanks to you for that uh, uh, introduction. And um, what I would uh, like to uh, do, first of all, is to uh, thank our gracious hosts at the uh, embassy, U.S. Embassy in Paris, as well as the, uh, the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs at the Department of State for helping to, uh, to arrange and to coordinate this. As, uh, as Mr. Dugut observed, it's a very dreary and rainy uh, morning here in Washington. And I hope that the uh, weather is better than that in Paris. I've never been in Paris in the springtime, but I've heard about it. And I saw that the sun was shining at least a few days ago. So as Mr. Duguid observed, this is an extremely uh, timely topic. I think in my view, I want to just stress, of course, that these are my personal views. I'm only speaking on behalf of myself at the moment. But uh, disinformation has a great deal of continuity in Europe uh, in particular. And of course, it has to be viewed in the context of a uh, much broader competition that dates back uh, during the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States. So Bogdan, if you don't mind, if you would just please uh, show uh, the audience the first slide. So I hope that everyone is able to see this first slide, which um, is an indication of the way that the world was portrayed during the Cold War for over 40 years, starting in the late 1940s, the early 1950s, going on through the end of the 1980s until the breakup of the Soviet Union in the 90s, early 90s. So um, the point is that it's Europe in particular that was viewed as an intellectual 
battleground uh, between uh, the East and the West. And, uh, and so I think this uh, illustration uh, gives an impression to, uh, to all of you about that. One of the key uh, subcomponents, of course, of this intellectual battle that went on between the Soviet Union and the United States is in the field of cultural diplomacy. So um, we're talking about the fact that uh, Europe was a battleground for ideas. And uh, in that sense, I, uh, I think that um, we should mention a journal, an intellectual journal that was started. It was an, a, a journal of ideas called Encounter, uh, founded by the West in the 1950s, uh, focused very much on information warfare. So information warfare is in fact um, a subcomponent of political warfare. And uh, these were exemplified by uh, this um, field of cultural diplomacy that we've been talking about, which in particular was exemplified by what are called surrogate radio stations. In the case of the Soviet Union, Radio Moscow, and the United States had two primary surrogate radio stations. One was Radio for Europe, which we'll be able to talk about, and Radio Liberty, as well as the Voice of America. So we looked at a number of ways in which to engage each other, meaning uh, Americans, Europeans, and of course on our side to engage uh, Soviet audiences. And one of the ways that we discovered that we could do that was in the field of music. So for example, even when I lived in Moscow in the 1990s and in the early part of the 21st century, there were clubs of, uh, of uh, aficionados of jazz, American jazz, that had first been exposed to American jazz uh, for the first time on The Voice of America through a host whose name was Willis Conover. And so Willis Conover became a hero in uh, the Soviet Union without our intending him to become one. But um, during this sort of field of discovery about each other, we realized um, both on the Soviet Union and on the US side that the only way for the West to combat disinformation would be through truth. And, uh, and I think one of the things that uh, certainly we in the West discovered and belatedly the Soviet Union did is that one size doesn't fit all in terms of how to engage audiences in these particular countries of Europe. So for example, if we look at France, France had a very long relationship with Russia and I use Russia and the Soviet Union in some cases interchangeably as we'll see, it was very different from the US Soviet relationship. So France has had a very long relationship with Russia that um, is significantly different from the relationship that we've had. But nonetheless, there's a continuity of disinformation that we can trace from that period that I'm discussing now from the late 1940s to the early 50s to today. So the idea is that, of course, there was the end of history when the Soviet Union uh, collapsed um, in the early 90s, as I said. And in fact, that's not the case. In fact, uh, modern Russia under President Putin has offered some very striking parallels with the past in terms of the field of disinformation. So we see that many of the themes, many of the uh, many of the topics that were very prevalent during the Cold War are in fact being pursued assiduously uh, by uh, modern uh, Russian um, criminologists in the Kremlin. So the fact is that uh, if we look at, for example, something that uh, modern Russia is calling Ruski Mir, which is the Russian world, this is an idea of Russian influence that's comprehensive uh, throughout Europe and in fact in the world. But one small example of this that we can talk about is that it includes uh, communities of Russians that have been living in France for a very long period of time, for example, since the 1830s. Uh, there is a, um, a quite famous Russian Orthodox Church in Nice uh, where Russians have been uh, worshiping since the 1830s. And from the Russian perspective, even though they may not agree, they're looked at as a vector of influence by, by modern Russia. So this is something to think about in terms of plus a change, plus a même chose, what's changed and what has not changed. In the past, the emphasis was on very large scale cultural events. Um, so for example, there were exhibitions held both in the Soviet Union and here in the United States by, by each side. And uh, these were one way in which each side tried to influence the other. But today, uh, those influences are, of course, different. They're more subtle. In many cases, they're more nu nu nuanced. Uh, 
So in the Cold War, these would include things like chess competitions, which the US and the Soviet sides engaged in, piano competitions, for example, music competitions that uh, one of the famous American pianists won Van Cliburn in Moscow. But today, as I say, these types of confrontations have morphed significantly into things uh, that are more in this field of social media that your generation, of course, is much, for, much more familiar with. And even though the, the, the field may have changed, uh, but what has not changed is the fact that there are vectors of influence that are still very predominant. So according to the Gerasimov doctrine, Gennady Gerasimov is a Soviet, um, really a Russian now expert on disinformation. There are seven levels of warfare. We're not going to go into all of them, but the level of warfare that is most um, talked about, discussed in modern Russia, in fact, is the level of warfare known as disinformatia, disinformation, which is a critical ongoing component, uh, as Mr. Dugan introduced, of what in fact is modern Russian uh, ways of influencing the West. And so what they found are there new mechanisms, whereas in the past, the Soviet Union might have used indigenous communist parties uh, in Europe, for example, the communist party in France, Georges Marchais, Georges Marchais it's now shifted significantly to the cybersphere. And so what we are now witnessing is the ability of uh, the Russians to significantly influence and exploit the cybersphere in ways as we are going to discuss together in, the, in our Q and answer uh, session of uh, what is termed agents of influence in terms of both cultural and information uh, warfare. So this is a, a, a kind of a continuity, but also um, it demonstrates their flexibility about how they've been able to significantly move from a uh, fairly static model to a new model. Um, to indicate just a little bit about how things have changed and how they're the same. In 1956, there's an interesting quote from the US President Dwight Eisenhower, which I'll just read briefly to give an indication of how things have, have moved and how they haven't uh, changed at all. So President Eisenhower said in 1956, if we're going to take advantage of the assumption that all people want peace, then the problem is for people to get together and to leap governments, if necessary, to evade governments, to work out not one method, but rather thousands of methods by which people can gradually learn a little bit more of each other. So that was in 1956, and we did this, as I mentioned, through a number of different ways uh, in principle, art, music, culture, and most of all, exchanges. And there are several key examples of that, uh, including a very famous um, member of the Politburo named Yakovlev, who started out as an exchange scholar a uh, Fulbright scholar in the United States, later rose to become, as I say, a senior member of the Politburo, but he uh, was really pivotal in ending the Soviet engagement in Afghanistan. And one can see then the influence of exchanges over a very, very long period of time. Another one, of course, is a famous KGB general named Oleg Kalugin, many of you have heard of, who started also as a Fulbright exchange scholar at Columbia University. So those are small indications of the long-term effect that exchanges can have on, uh, on uh, another potential audience or to engage, uh, in some cases even, what is considered to be an enemy. So um, many levels of benign and not so benign influence, including, for example, the fact that the long-term goal of the Soviet Union and now, of course, Russia has been the same, which is what? Which is to separate Europe from the United States to separate NATO allies, and most of all, of course, to create and to sow dissension and to a certain extent chaos in Europe itself. So to separate one European from another. This has been the long-term goal in, uh, in Western Europe has been referred to as the long twilight struggle. And in, uh, in the case of the Soviet Union, they, for example, did it uh, during the Vietnam War and of course highlighting uh, Watergate. But those themes now, have only changed, they've only morphed into the social media sphere, as I say, um, so that now that you see the, the same kind of competition going on, which again, we're not able to 
adequately uh, respond to or to exploit uh, from a diplomatic or dis disinformation perspective. And I wanted to offer you a few, very few brief examples of how that's uh, uh, engaged today, uh, for example, in France and in Europe. So from, some of you are familiar with uh, radio and TV Sputnik, sponsored by Russia, as well as uh, RT, which is Russia Today. One of the main themes that, uh, as Mr. Dugan is saying, has been highlighted during the COVID-19 uh, epidemic is what's been termed an infodemic, uh, an information pandemic, which is to say that, for example, one of the items that has been highlighted very recently uh, within the last two weeks on, uh, on RT and Sputnik is the fact that uh, French uh, doctors, French medical personnel, have abandoned the elderly in their uh, elder care facilities, which is completely untrue, but it's been propagated on, uh, on radio and TV, uh, Russia and on Sputnik Radio. Another one, uh, again, this racist trope that they uh, find has worked very well is that uh, they've propagated the fact that they say French politicians have highlighted yellow people, quote unquote, don't get the virus. Obviously, again, if you repeat the lie often enough, it can become the truth. Um, during the um, last couple of years, the Russians were very adept at exploiting the wave of refugees that came to Europe. So one of the main tropes that they had was, of course, highlighting the case of the rape of a young girl in Germany that never happened, but it resonated throughout German media as an example of uh, the disinformation that's conducted today. Um, Foreign Minister Vedrin in, in 1918, or oh, sorry, 2018, uh, introduced a bill to the National Assembly in France, which they passed in November of 2018 to limit foreign uh, engagement in election, uh, elections in France. That's probably a first step. I don't think it will be a last step. Another example of what's been happening just this week is on, uh, on Russia Today and on uh, Sputnik Radio, they've highlighted the director of the World Health Organization, who is an Ethiopian. And um, they have suggested, well, they've actually explicitly said that Taiwan has been using the N-word about him, which is completely untrue. But it's an indication of how and how deep uh, these lies are propagated by um, by uh, Russia today, and, and certainly one sees that continuity. What I think I might do there is, uh, is stop with my formal part of the lecture, because I'd like to give enough opportunity for everyone to ask questions. Uh, one of the questions that we had, for example, uh, was very clear, which was a question regarding, regarding, um, pardon me, um, Sorry, just one second. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. The question was about uh, May 8th. And so what is the Russian role in May 8th? And quite honestly, uh, at this point in time, what we can say is that the Russians have been, of course, uh, um, affected by COVID-19 to the point where they had to cancel the, uh, the um, uh, celebrations for Victory Day on May 8th. And uh, that was very significant because what was going to happen is a real exercise in propaganda. And the Russians, obeying Soviet tradition, were going to make a huge uh, um, deal of the 75th anniversary of the end of the war. And we're going to try to rope everyone in because the Russian and Soviet goal has always been to highlight the fact that it was the Soviet Union that bore the majority of casualties during the World War, and it was the Soviet Union that bore the brunt of the war in general, rather than the allies in the West, for example. And that's been a, a theme they've highlighted, but they have not been able to, to do that. Um, so let me go to um, a question that we had from Jean Plassard at Sciences Po, who was asking, are we prepared in the West to engage in a, um, really what is a war, for want of a better term, of disinformation with Russia? In my personal view, no, we're not. We're not prepared to do that at the moment because we had a great deal of hubris after the end of the Cold War. You remember these articles that came out, uh, for example, from Francis Fukuyama saying that we've won. The war has been won and the West won. Well, 
uh, that may not have been the case in the sense, especially in the sphere of, of uh, political warfare, information warfare, where it's clear that uh, we're not prepared to deal with the onslaught uh, of propaganda emanating from Russia and China. So we have a, a question um, from uh, Raphael that I'll, uh, I'll be talking about. Um, and Raphael is asking a question about why we're doing the conference today. Raphael, my, my own sense of that, if I can try to answer your question, is that we chose this moment in principle, as Mr. Duguid was saying, because of COVID-19 and because of the infodemic that's going on. So we're confronted now with the fact that um, if you take a look, for example, at the way that Russia has been massively exploiting this horrific virus for their own um, disinformation goals. And by that, I mean, for example, the landing of a big Tupolev cargo plane in Rome to demonstrate how much Russia is doing for Italy. Most of the items on that plane were not really uh, medically usable, but it became an incredible propaganda victory for Russia. And it was also a moment that Russia used to attack any Italian journalist who wanted to, ex to explore the topic and to find out what actually was being donated and how. So maybe that, uh, that helps to answer some of your question, um, Rafael. I'll go on to a question from uh, Omran. And Omran is asking about uh, um, what does a person who disinforms risk? If I understand the question correctly, um, Omran, um, they risk uh, a lot uh, if, if it's the West, because we can only have a reputation, which is the truth. Uh, in terms of the Russian response, I think that uh, the way that the Grassimov Doctrine has, has outlined it and has articulated it very clearly, uh, they look at it as a key level of their engagement with the West, and uh, they, they look at it as a risk from their point of view, that's not only worth taking, but that they do every day. Um, Chloe uh, is asking about whether such mechanisms of disinformation uh, exist in the, in the US. And again, what I would say, Chloe, is that we've certainly tried to do our best to combat um, disinformation in the US, and we certainly do as much as possible, but very, our, our tools are very limited, because our tools are limited to what we can talk about in terms of ourselves and the truth, but we're not going to engage in disinformation ourselves. We don't, we don't do that. We don't, we don't stoop to that level, if you will. So it kind of is similar to John's question about how do we combat it. I think we're still working on mechanisms of how to encourage uh, a better coordination among allies in the West, and uh, hopefully that's what we're even doing today. So uh, let's see if- uh, Just to read the um, uh, Vanna question that I see on, on uh, Facebook, is there any way to prevent uh, them from affecting the upcoming elections in November? This uh, is a question from Kate at uh, Engberg. Yeah, Kate, thank you so much for that question. Um, you know, it's, it's a question that I think we ask ourselves in the US every single day. Um, on the one hand, we're, we're obviously doing our best to be as vigilant as possible. On the other hand, um, to be very frank, this is my personal opinion, but the Russian ability to engage on social media is unprecedented. And so in that sense, um, I think it's a foregone conclusion to say that they will uh, be able to influence the election in November. The only point that we can probably try to emphasize is to limit the vectors of that influence. So we're now aware, for example, of all the different fake Facebook postings. We're aware of all of the internet trolls. We're aware of some of the things that they engaged in four years ago. But does that mean that we can prevent it all from happening? Unfortunately, Kate, I, I don't think so. And I hope that that answers the question. Um, but the point is that, you know, it's something that for Western elections in general, we all need to be vigilant. We need to work together and we need to identify to the extent possible, the sources of those social media false accounts. And of course, we're looking for cooperation from uh, organizations like Facebook that have now uh, offered to step up to do that. Um, 
it looks like we have a couple of more questions that uh, I think I'll try to see. So um, there's a question about the estimation of the proportion of the use of disinformation. Uh, let's see, do, do we think this is an argument the Russian side could use? Let me make sure that I got that question. Are you able to see that at all, uh, Bogdan? Let me read that for you. Uh, could you give us an estimation of the proportion of the use of disinformation at a political or economic end in the world? I don't know if we have an exact sense of that. Um, what I would say is that it is true that uh, uh, we can reckon that a significant portion, unfortunately, of the social media that we observe is in fact uh, not, not real content, it's, it's fake. Um, I don't know if I can tell you the exact proportion, but um, again, it points out to the need for everyone to be vigilant about this and to look at the source of information. As I mentioned to you, the example that I gave you about the refugees in, uh, in Europe, in particular in Germany, if one had looked at how did that rumor start, one could have said, hey, this, this has no basis in truth. But for several days, it was the topic du jour in, in Germany uh, as why these refugees are coming and why are they committing these kind of sexual crimes, none of which was, was true, actually. So oh, uh, let's there, see, can you see the question? Yeah, there's a follow-up uh, question from yeah. uh, Raphael. It says, you point out yes. the disinformation campaign coming from Russia. Um, yes. But um, don't you think China is the most serious threat under this aspect? For instance, the allegation that French medical personnel abandoned the elderly has been perpetrated by the Chinese ambassador in France as well. No, that's a really excellent point, Raphael. We focused a little bit today on Russia, but you're perfectly right. Absolutely, I 100% agree that Russia, that China is not immune from that, and China engages um, really now almost at the equal level of, of Russia. And certainly, as you say, that rumor from the Chinese ambassador uh, is absolutely true, as you say. I mean, the rumor wasn't true, but that, that he said it was true. It's also true that uh, the Chinese have been propagating a very vicious rumor regarding COVID-19, that the US Army invented it, and that they were the, uh, um, the uh, sort of inventors of this virus that uh, was deliberately spread in China. So this came not from some uh, sort of abstract source, but from the foreign ministry spokesman in Beijing. So I absolutely concur with you uh, on that point, Rafael. Well, one a other question from Eric Herzler. It says, infodemics is a really interesting concept. What are the responsibility of continuous 24-7 news channels since the launch of CNN? Yeah, great point, great point. Well, you know, this is the kind of thing where I think, uh, as I was trying to indicate, if you repeat the lie often enough, uh, it tends to somehow or other sometimes become the truth. And in that sense, what I mean is that uh, RT, Russia Today, and Sputnik have been propagating lie after lie during COVID-19 to the point where I do think that some of the uh, falsehoods have become, in a sense, regarded as unfortunately fact. And that's a really sad aspect of how social media is so pervasive, as you say, and the effectiveness or the efficacy of, uh, of these modern 24-7 uh, news channels. As you say, they keep repeating it over and over again. And it, it does tend to unfortunately be lodged in, uh, in the psyches of many people. Okay. Another question that has uh, come in um, via Facebook from uh, Robert Ionitescu, uh, but can we engage in information war trying to, just one second, um, uh, trying to bring information to the Russian public in the same vein as the Radio Voice of America or Radio for Europe did during the Cold War? Yeah, Robert, thank you. That's a really excellent question. So um, let me just briefly discuss them if you don't mind. During the period of the Cold War, as you said, we did agree, meaning the Soviet Union and the United States, to uh, engage each other. And one of the ways that we did that were through publications, as you say. There was a glossy pictorial that was uh, available all, all through the US, and it was free, of course. It wasn't, uh, there was no charge. It was called Soviet Life. And the Russians have a modern version of it called Russian Life. We had our own, um, corollary to that publication called America, which was also available throughout the Soviet Union. But your point is 
today, what are we doing? So we continue to emphasize exchanges and we run one of the largest exchange programs that the US government has in the world with Russia. That's one way to expose younger Russians who are more or less your age uh, to American life. And we do that with high school students, with university students. And of course, we continue to do that with graduate students. But one of the other things that we've done is quite interesting. It's called uh, an internet access and training program that we started when I was living in Moscow in the early part of this century. And the idea is to give internet access, which wasn't available everywhere, to younger Russians, not with any conditions, but just to expose them to what's available on the web. So I think that's been a very successful effort because uh, as you know, uh, the web is heavily censored in, inside Russia. And the other thing that we've done, I think the other initiative that I believe has been very successful is to start something called American Corners or Lincoln Corners in Russian un university libraries and in libraries across Russia. That's an opportunity for younger Russians, your age again, to be able to read uh, things from the West in Russian and in English as well, that I think has been successful and is sort of a, a successor to the programs that we had during the Cold War. So there's some minor examples of that as well. Another question from Om Omran Eradi. Um, at what point can we talk about disinformation and where does an information become a disinformation according to you? Well, I think that line is sometimes gray, but usually is very black and white. And that line between information and disinformation is when the truth becomes perverted and becomes propaganda. So as I said, one of the things that clearly distinguishes the West in general from Russia is that we don't engage in disinformation at all uh, in any of the, the Western uh, media channels that we use. Disinformation is, for want of a better term, another word for propaganda. It's not the truth. It's, uh, it's information that's been distorted uh, for the um, the prevalence of a particular um, objective. And in this case, it's to, uh, to, uh, to fool people, as we're saying with the recent examples that we brought up during COVID-19. And before that, certainly many, many examples during the Cold War. Um, one other question from uh, Daniel Sandu. It says, considering the level of damage produced by state entities economically, do you consider a coordinated response from democratic countries could be the right answer to prevent further damage? Again, thank you for an excellent question. Again, my personal opinion is that the more coordination, the better. Absolutely, I agree that we're not coordinated right now in the field of what we would call public diplomacy, which is not disinformation, which is very different from disinformation, but we're not coordinated to deal with the plethora of disinformation. So that's certainly true in terms of your point about Economic uh, entities and engagement absolutely agree that the allies should uh, do much more to coordinate uh, together and certainly I view public diplomacy as a key dimension of that. Thank you. Uh, one other question from Eric uh, Herzler. Uh, what do you think of the audition of Mark Zuckerberg in the House of Representatives on fake news? Is there any legal responsibilities of CEOs of social uh, networks, social media networks? Yeah, again, another great question uh, from Eric. So Eric, you know, this is all new, right? Uh, for your generation, it's passe, but for many people, it's new. How do we deal, as you say, with a, a conglomerate like Facebook? Facebook has what, something more than 3.5 billion, billion with a B users around the world. It's obviously international. It's obviously in more than 186 countries around the world. How does the US Congress deal with an organization like that? Well, it has, to be, um, it has to be nuanced. It has to be subtle. It has to be in a way that we can convince Mark Zuckerberg that it's not in Facebook's interest to have hundreds and thousands of fake accounts, that it, it draws away from the appeal of Facebook in general to have that kind of false propaganda propagated. So it's a matter of, of engaging him, engaging Facebook, uh, engaging them in a two-way dialogue and I think the Congress is only starting to do that. But we're certainly aware of the massive, um, again, influence that Facebook as an organization has, the number of accounts. And I think Zuckerberg has come around to the fact that he personally agrees that having uh, thousands of fake social media accounts, Facebook, Facebook accounts, Facebook groups is not in Facebook's interest. So it's, I, would say, I would describe it as an ongoing dialogue. I don't think that dialogue is concluded. 
I think it's just barely begun. One other question from uh, Antonius Fuss. Um, is there a political slash legal framework for the US or the state government to combat disinformation? Well, another great question. Well, the answer to that, you know, in terms of the United States really is just our constitution, which, um, which prohibits us from engaging in, in, uh, in any kind of, you know, falsehoods or, or uh, propaganda. There's a famous um, act of Congress called the smith mund Act, which uh, only allows us to establish um, mechanisms such as, as we're talking about, radio, TV, and other things, to engage audiences, but, but simply by describing and by telling people what's going on uh, in the U.S., uh, sort of a, an approach that includes what we call warts and all, so the, the, the full truth. And uh, even with our surrogate radio stations that we had, I mentioned Radio Liberty and Radio Fear, by the way, both of which are active, their objective is to tell the truth about the countries that they are operating in. So in the case of Radio for Europe, it's in the individual countries of Europe. And in the case of Radio Liberty, it's Russia. But to describe and to, to uh, talk about events that are going on in that country, but only from a truthful point of view. So um, I actually think that's the, maybe the strongest weapon we have, um, because it's what clearly distinguishes us from Russia and as others in the audience have been saying from China as well. So I believe it's something that uh, in the long run, in my opinion, will be actually much more effective than this uh, propaganda. That's my personal view. Another question from Alexandre Bourgeois. Uh, one solution would be to point out this lying government as you do today. Would it be politically possible to spread these ideas more widely? That's a great point, Tanzanu. Yes. I mean, I think the extent to which we can identify them, first of all, talk about them openly, and give them the oxygen, the open air, to say, look, where did this rumor start? As one of the audience members was saying, it started with the Chinese ambassador in, uh, in Paris. Okay, let's identify it, let's talk about it, let's, let's propagate the fact that we know what they're doing. And by the way, for example, the US Embassy in Moscow has been very instrumental in this. We, we, when we find elements or when we find examples of real disinformation uh, that they do very often, for example, even on the embassy's own Facebook page, we highlight it, we identify it, and we say, this is what it is. And by the way, this was completely fake. And oftentimes they'll, they'll have a letter that was ostensibly written by an American official at the embassy. And we'll point out the grammatical errors. We'll point out how false that letter must be and is uh, by, by the nature of how it's written. So I think the more that we do, as I say, provide oxygen and give air to showing that we're aware of what's going on and that we're not shy about publicizing it, you make an excellent point, Alexander. I believe that we should do that. Uh, Raphael has also a question. I don't know of American um, official media which propagates quote unquote fake news, mm -hmm. uh, but the American president regularly uh, has words which may be considered as disinformation. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is an argument the Russian side could use? In theory, Raphael, it's possible. Anything is possible. I mean, I do think that, uh, that social media in general, uh, let's say that Twitter in general uh, specifically is something that can be exploited by, by either side. I don't think uh, in, in the case of the US there are any intentional uh, misstatements, but certainly when something isn't, uh, isn't absolutely 100% factual, it gives an opportunity for any side to exploit that. I, I agree with that. One other one from Omran. The media is known to play an important role in disinformation, even in the West. Is it possible to regulate them without reducing freedom of expression? Another great question, uh, Omran. Well, that's a, that's a, a difficult uh, uh, circle to square. In other words, how do we do that? So, as you say, the tradition of the West is free information. Obviously, it's a two-edged sword because it does open up avenues uh, for exploitation as Russia and China do very, very well. What I can say is that the road to regulation may be more harmful than, um, than it's worth. In other words, is the cure more harmful than, than this disease, which is disinformation? In my opinion, um, regulating information is a very dangerous and tricky path that the West has to be uh, very vigilant about. That's just my personal view.
uh, a question from uh, Flor uh, Lestrade. Uh, you said that U.S. wasn't using disinformation contrary to Russia. Therefore, how can we consider President Trump's fake news? Well, again, I think in terms of how do we consider it, um, you know, I'm not sure that, uh, unfortunately, this term fake news has been propagated probably far too widely. But as I said, the, the main tool or the main resource that the West has, whether we're talking about COVID-19 or anything else, are facts. And when we provide facts, that's when we're able to best uh, combat any disinformation that's out there. That's, that's again, a view that I have, but I think it's a view that's shared by many uh, in, in the West and certainly by experts that the more oxygen we give to falsehoods, uh, in a sense, the better we can expose them. But at the same time, the best way to, uh, to combat that is with facts and with truth regarding COVID-19 or with anything else, as we're talking about infodemics. Uh, Leonard is asking, are the disinformation tactics from China similar to those of the Soviet Union, or are they using new methods? Uh, great question again. I'm not a China expert, but what I would say is the following. China is definitely taking the playbook from the former Soviet Union, exploding any and all the tools that they used and adding new ones. The new ones that they're using are the ones that we've talked about, the example of the Chinese ambassador in Paris, but also the foreign ministry spokesman himself who wasn't shy for weeks about propagating an extraordinary falsehood that he knew and everyone knew to be false, that the US Army had invented this virus, which was really uh, a, a really atrocious uh, thing to be saying from that podium, but he had no shyness about it. So I would say that they've taken probably the worst, most egregious examples from the former Soviet Union and added to them. That's, that's again, my view. Uh, another question from, uh, this time from Facebook, uh, from Anya Fabiani. What about the influence of disinformation in Eastern Europe and in the Western Balkans? Okay, can, can you repeat that again, please? Uh, what about the influence of disinformation in Eastern Europe and in the Western Balkans? Well, you know, again, Anya, you may know more about this than I do, but what I would say is the following, that from a Russian perspective, they look at that region as key for them. Um, in particular, they look at it as a, an extension of what they call the near abroad. So they look at it as an extension of the Nizhny uh, which is the Russian term for that. So they put a lot of effort into disinformation in the region you're talking about. And in particular, they're exploiting historic links that exist among Eastern Slavs and Russians through things like the Russian Orthodox Church, which we'd say, why the church? Well, it's something that they know that unites um, Eastern Slavs, for example, if we're talking about the Balkans, the Serbs in particular, and, uh, and Russians. So Anya, you may know more about it, but I would say that they're going back to a playbook that Russians have been exploiting probably even before the Soviets for the last 150 years of the Slavic-Russian uh, relationship based on historic uh, ties that include as I say, using the church, the Russian Orthodox Church, as a vector of influence. A question from uh, Sarah. Regarding the current situation in the U.S. with the anti-containment demonstrations, uh, I, guess, I guess these are the uh, demonstrations against the stay-home uh, uh, orders, do you think disinformation plays an important role? Actually, a great, great question. Alice. So, again, this is my personal view, but my answer would be yes. My answer would be anything that can serve to create chaos, to divide people, is in Russia's direct interest from their point of view. So if they can exploit uh, seams in society, seams that exist on the basis of tension from the rising rate of unemployment, from the rising social and economic tensions as a result of increasing unemployment, increasing uh, job losses and so forth. They will absolutely do that. And they will also point out about how this is an element of why the West is, is lacking coherency, why the West is on the road to disintegration, why uh, American, for example, US institutions, Congress, uh, the White House don't work properly. They will exploit any and every seam uh, 
possible. And I do believe you're absolutely correct. COVID-19 is an ideal example of it. And the fact that you have a situation where there are uh, legitimate groups in the US who question the stay-at-home orders, uh, yes, they are, they are more than willing and able to exploit those groups, and they do. I, I, I agree with you. Um, and um, just, uh, I think, uh, in the uh, interest of time, um, I will um, just have uh, uh, one last question. Um, I will uh, read this one. It's from um, Alexandra Bastos. It's a, at the beginning of the COVID crisis, uh, some main information about the danger of the virus were at first called fake news. Um, even by the U.S. president. It had huge consequences. So how could we check uh, that there is um, or is not disinformation when our politicians often fail to identify it? Alexander, again, that's a great question. I don't know if I have the full answer for you, but I do think that it, it's possible, and I say this candidly, that we in the West made some mistakes about COVID-19. Certainly it's true that I think we underestimated the full uh, impact of this virus. We underestimated the extraordinary uh, damage, the, the rate of infection that we're seeing today. Uh, obviously, the US is the country most affected in the world by this now. So you're right that uh, statements that were made probably early on on all sides, including our side, might have given the wrong impression and might have given an ability for others to exploit. I, I agree with that and I concur with it. I think we've learned a lot uh, within the last month or so. I think we're doing our best to, to recover from that. I think we're taking it very seriously now. I don't think anyone at an official level underestimates the seriousness of this uh, disease of this virus. And um, you know, there was, there was a degree of uh, lack of facts of information. And, and as you point out, Alexander, also a degree of unfortunate disinformation in the beginning. That's true. Bogdan, um, are we uh, are we getting close to the end or? Uh... Yeah, I think we're. Um, I, I see there are a few uh, more questions there, but uh, just in the interest of time, if you um, have any um, maybe closing remarks uh, that you would want to make. Sure. Thank you, Bogdan. Yeah, I mean, again, I want to just say to everyone, the questions that you've been asking indicate a very high level of interest and also a very high level of seriousness about this topic. And I think the main point that we would like to try to emphasize is the fact that there's been such extraordinary continuity in Russian slash disinformation starting, you know, in your grandparents' time uh, and going on today. So whether we're talking about Soviet disinformation efforts after the uh, end of the Second World War, and if we look at Russian disinformation today with your generation, there are some remarkable and very striking parallels. And the COVID-19 epidemic, the pandemic, the infodemic, as we're calling it, is a great example of, of this uh, today. So I wanna thank all of you for your uh, great attention and for the questions that you've asked. I found them highly uh, uh, intelligent and uh, stimulating. Thank you very much. Van, thank you very much. Um, that was a great presentation and as you noted, uh, there, was also, there were also excellent questions. If I can just sum up then uh, our discussion today. Um, first, <clears throat> we learned that the use of disinformation and propaganda is uh, an ages old tactic. We learned that uh, the West is in particular vulnerable to um, both uh, disinformation and propaganda because of the, uh, because of the, uh, the constitutional and legal um, uh, nature of, of our societies where it is protected. We've learned that both Russia and China are using disinformation and propaganda. Russia to try and divide uh, Western nations one from another and also really to divide different levels of society uh, from one from the other in order to advance their strategic uh, interests and that is a divided West is less of a threat to Russia. Chinese, uh, on the other hand, are began using propaganda. That is, uh, propaganda is something where there's an element of truth in what they say. For example, when the uh, uh, Chinese sent um, medical equipment to Italy, they said it was a donation. Uh, 
when in fact it was not. It was being sold uh, to the Italians, but to say it was a donation made them look better. So that's an element of propaganda. We also uh, found that the Chinese are now uh, using the uh, uh, infodemic, as, as you called it, uh, with uh, the false claims by their ambassadors. So they have now changed uh, the way that they are, are operating. And that uh, the way that we need to fight back is to push facts into the information sphere as much as possible. Both our politicians and our media have a responsibility to do this. So I think that was an excellent, uh, an excellent discussion. I thank you for participating. I thank also all the participants in Paris and all who viewed online for taking part today. We wish you well, and please um, stay safe and be healthy. Thank you.